let's just get started. Uh, because I'm actually a little angry. Um, what uh, we saw today, earlier today, with VMware is awesome, amazing. They're going to take you great places, but I'm afraid they'll take you there a little bit too late. You don't have to like me for saying that. And I don't want to tell you this because I have any disrespect for VMware. I have a tremendous amount of respect for VMware. They changed my life. They changed all of our careers. And so before I even get into all of that, let's just say, you know, who, who is this Mark guy? Why, why all this stuff? I don't like talking about myself, but uh, I inadvertently became one of the first internet engineers at the first national ISP back in Harvard Square and back, back in 1993. Uh, that's even before the web. Um, Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation bought us up and I went down to New York City and I built Fox Digital News, so maybe I helped Mr. Trump get elected, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but I have an infrastructure as code blog on GitHub, mlavi.github.io. You can learn about all my trials and travails. I was a Netscape technology evangelist for JavaScript, for LDAP. I built the plugin finder. Uh, that's why I have all these grays. And um, long story short, uh, I've helped run NASCAR, not F1, unfortunately, uh, live on Amazon with WebSocket. Uh, I did all that operations for all the races for the season. And then, uh, most recently, I was a DevOps manager uh, for a puppet shop. We were a cloud VPN company, so I have a lot of respect for what NSX delivers, but we need to get it into other hypervisors. And I, most recently, for the last two years, have been at Calm, which Nutanix acquired about three, year, uh, three months ago. So I'm one of the latest Nutanix employees, but that's me. If you want to learn more, you can. I'm not an ego. Uh, I'm just going to tell you the truth and get you the most value I can in this short time we have together. So uh, Calm is a DevOps automation platform. Nutanix acquired us so that we can deliver applications anywhere. In fact, I, if anything, you can say Nutanix very much represents the entire vision. Our, our uh, VP uh, and CT office of the CTO, Joe Bagley, represented. Except we deliver this now, not next year. And so as much respect as I have for VMware, I don't want them to slow you down. Because if we go back to what Joe said, we have to start with the user. We have to deliver applications now. We need to deliver business relevancy now. And the only way to do that is with DevOps. It's not with designs that are infrastructure bound. And typically, the VMware pattern is to start with the infrastructure where their strength is and extend their platform and keep their value there and keep you there. Now, this is great, and I think Joe is absolutely right. When we get to cross-cloud, we'll be able to unlock the potential of being on-prem and off-prem anywhere at any time. But this is the Nutanix Enterprise Cloud strategy, and we're already delivering it, not next year. Um, so yeah, we have to start with the user. And if you look at every Nutanix um, press release or our .next conference that just happened last week in Vienna, you will see the press releases that will come for VMware next year, I argue. Test me on that, please. Test me on that. You may not like me for it, but test me on it. Because we're delivering value. We started with the user years ago. So we, one other thing about the local team in Italy, we don't, I asked them, what do the customers and the partners sell? Do they sell this size machine? Do they sell this size infrastructure? Do they do it only for VDI? And they said, no, Mark, we don't have a typical customer. We don't have a typical solution. We only don't sell one size. We fix the customer's problems. Then we design the solution for it. And so this is what the partners and Nutanix does for you here in Italy. And I can't tell you they sell 30% VDI or anything like that where the other parts of the company are focused on that. I see in Italy, they solve the customer's problems. And that's the value you get out of Nutanix in it Italia. And I couldn't be prouder to be part of this team if only for this week. So come there, and this is one other thing I know, because we talk about customers and starting with the user first. From the top of this company, when I started three months ago at sales kickoff, they said, we will never let the customer fail. So the brilliance of Christian, the brilliance of Mara, the br brilliance of Matteo, everybody on the team that's at our booth, at booth number seven, they will never let you fail. And I can guarantee that because I already know that's the value, the core value of our company. 
We're here to keep you as a customer forever. But not by giving you more lock-in, as our host does, but by continuing to deliver value. And when our host cites Amazon as the exemplar for delivering value every month, every couple months, you will see Nutanix already doing that too. I like to compare us to Amazon, not to VMware. And I like to say that we can beat Amazon. I think we're the only company that can. And I hope VMware catches up because we need to kick their butts. <laughs> okay, so that's enough. Um, one other criticism and also help. Massimo did an incredible job helping start to understand this journey for all the infrastructure and operations and data center people to DevOps. But I'd argue he only got us started. I want to take you there further now. So let's just start there. Uh, yeah. So he was correct. Nobody has a universal definition of DevOps. It doesn't exist. It's a culturally rendered term. It's bound to the people who practice it, just like security. Uh, my previous uh, commentator, speaker, whoops, let's get rid of that. We don't need notes. Let's make this full screen. He said security is designed. It's absolutely true. DevOps is designed too. We have to gain the skills, we have to gain the ability to, and we have to gain a mindset to accomplish DevOps. Is it a thing? Is it static? Is it security 1.0? Is it DevOps 1.0? No, it's, it's a process. So I'll give you a definition of DevOps, and I want you to use this lens, this definition, to look at everything, to look at VMware, to look at Nutanix, to look at Amazon, to look at your organization, to look at your IT department, and to look at your skill set, and see whether or not you're delivering value to the business. Because if you're not delivering value to the business, you're not delivering value to your customers, and you'll lose your customers, you'll lose your business, we'll lose our jobs. It's that simple. So DevOps is a process of delivering value. It's that simple. That's a business proposition, right? A business delivers value. But we need to make sure that there's no friction in delivering that value between the developer and the customer. And the developer can be his own or her own customer. If they are increasing the velocity for with which they create value with code on their own laptop so that's more configurable, more testable, more instrumentable, they're doing DevOps. If they do that for the QA team, if the QA team uh, can make the builds go faster, if the operations team can allow the developers to deploy faster, if the, de if the development team makes builds happen that much quicker, they're all doing DevOps because they're reducing the friction in delivering value to the customer. That's a business mission. It's really that simple. This is how we align engineering. This is how we align IT and operations. This is how we align the business. We deliver value to the customer. So now, take a look at VMware and tell you if they're giving you value, they are. But in what time frame and with what speed and how much friction are they causing you because you have to wait for them to deliver their value. I'm not sure you can wait, I can't. So DevOps success really is a mixture of culture and technology. The technology part's easy, <laughs> it really is. You pick the best tools that implement what you need to do, but it's the culture where the operators and the developers and the testers and the data center folks all work together. That's the hard part usually, where they start working together and they share the problems of the customer because they all need to deliver value to the customer as quickly as possible. So you see this lens now. You can apply it to anything. You can apply it to what I say and you can apply it to the products I represent. The big challenges we see universally Fragmentation, there's too many clouds, too many APIs, too many platforms, too many tools, and now we saw, this, this actually angered me, um, we saw how much VMware is delivering value in re-bringing containers, re-containing containers as VMs, so that you have to go through them to get to a Docker experience or a Kubernetes experience. Too much friction, actually. I'd argue it's not DevOps, it's indirection and it slows you down because you are now irrelevant to the rest of the community. There were some solutions where you could go native, I applaud that, but that's not where they led. That's not what they wanted you to do. They wanted you to stay inside the platform instead of going native. They gave you a pet's way to approach cattle, and that's not good. That's not enough value, that's friction. Okay, the other problem that we see besides the fragmentation that's out there 
is that people make the mistake of hiring DevOps people. We are all DevOps. We need to change our culture. We need to use the developers, the testers, the operators. These are the DevOps people. You don't hire DevOps people because then you concentrate all your work into that DevOps people, and you can't make an entire organization scale through its small team. It's impossible. DevOps does that for me. No, nope, we are DevOps. This is the uh, tools to success. It inverts the behaviors of developers coding stuff and saying it works on my laptop. It's QA's problem now. QA's saying I only have two weeks to test everything. I don't have enough time. It's operations problem now. Operations deploys it. Customer support and sales starts yelling at them because they missed something and the customers are on fire. So operations doesn't test, I mean doesn't trust uh, QA. QA doesn't trust the developers because they didn't de develop the proper product to work in production. So if we remember, start to the user, and Joe's talking about that short cycle to get to the customer, well, that's because developers don't care about production because the operators were in the way and the testers were in the way before that. This is an adversarial relationship. We need to invert that so that, as I said, the developers can deploy to production by themselves. The operators can do the latest build to get that hotfix back out to production. The testers can automate more of the testing so that they can increase the assurance and that they can build whenever they want to make sure their new tests work properly and they operate a testing platform that can scale. All right, out of manual operations, the whole point is that we get to dem democratize the domain expertise of all these different teams because now they all need to leverage each other to deliver value quickly to the customer. This allows us to make all of their work repeatable, auditable, and ultimately, automatable which means that's how we accomplish continuous integration, delivery, and deployment. And this means that there are no more long-lived servers or VMs. We don't care about that long-lived database. This is hard to get to. I won't say we get to it today, but we can get to short-lived databases, and we need to, because we can't have long-lived anything anymore. That's a single point of failure. This means ephemeral everything, temporary everything. We move state to rated databases, Cassandra databases, cloud-native databases, and we get out of the single point of failure for the database, and persistence can go anywhere. Disk persistence can also uh, be invoked appropriately by the right architectural models when we get out of our old mindsets. So this is how we get to ephemeral everything and truly achieve agility in engineering, and therefore agility for the business. And we can't just deliver that value, we have to measure it. We have to instrument all of our code, all of our tests, all of our operations. We have to measure how well they do. We have to measure how well they perform. And we have to make sure that every time we, a developer sends a shiny new feature, that they don't ship a performance defect as well. Only through instrumentation can we make sure that we didn't cost 100, new, 100 milliseconds slower on the website or an API rate. Only through metrics, monitoring, and logging can we get to those forensics and figure it out so that the developers develop for the customer, not for themselves. Okay, that's enough evangelism about DevOps. Uh, now you have a lens. If you don't know who Nutanix is, I'll give you, I'll give you what I learned in just a few minutes. Uh, and we'll only do a few more slides and then we'll get right to the demo because I'm not here to, to give you death by PowerPoint. So uh, we do, what do we do? We do hyper-converged infrastructure but that was the first chapter and the second chapter of the company. Um, long story short is that now that we're agnostic and driving really high performance workloads for any application from the storage tier, we leverage that into the hypervisor tier and the compute tier. So we don't care about RAID anymore. We don't care about SANS anymore. We care about scale out flexibility. We care about driving infinite scalability, no single points of failure anymore. And we have Acropolis as our storage story. Prism is our single pane of glass experience for management. And the end of the story is no more three-tier architecture. Incredible ROI, incredible TCO, incredible scale out, and the platform starts tuning itself for each workload. So we work great for almost every workload. And one-click upgrades. Remember, uh, was it Duncan talking about, hey, I really hate to do firmware upgrades? We're going to fix that next year in VMware. We've been doing it for a year at Nutanix. People update things, 
update their clusters in production from their iPhones on their airplanes. Some people love tweeting that stuff. This is the reality we've lived in for a year. I hope you join us. Okay, second thing, second chapter. Well, we did the same thing. Now that we understand disk workloads, we understand we worked on compute workloads, and we tried to deliver agnostic hyperver hypervisor value for your workloads. Hyper-V, Zen, uh, AHV is our kind of industrial strength um, KVM. And obviously, lots of respect to VMware, this is the most of our bread and butter. We deliver almost 80, upwards of 80%, I'd say, VMware. So if I sound disrespectful, I don't mean that. I'm very respectful for the business we generate and for the customers that we satisfy by delivering the best experience for VMware uh, on, on Nutanix hardware. And so we also, because we're hypervisor agnostic, we let you work with the best hypervisor for your workloads, we created Prism Central, which is our multi-cluster management interface. And I'll tell you why that's important in just a moment, but the summary is that we give you infinite scale through this distributed platform, distributed storage, distributed compute, which gives you increased choice and portability without lock-in. You want a VMware today? Get it. You want a Hyper-V for another thing, for a test cluster? Fine. You want a backup site on AHV without any VMware tax? We do that. That's what we do. Um, and it, the whole point is that the platform continues to increase the operational efficiencies through automation, built in. Workload agnostic performance tuning. So, what's the next chapter? Why am I upset that VMware is talking about it next year? Because we deliver the enterprise cloud today, and I'll show you that in the demo. If we know that the cloud commoditized infrastructure, well, Nutanix has commoditized the cloud. You can drive your workloads anywhere today, and I'll show that to you. I don't care if it's public cloud. I don't care if it's data center. I don't care if it's container. I don't care if it's VM or bare metal. We bring all these things together. We deploy them in a hybrid fashion. We put cost controls, auditability, and everything else you could possibly need to do lifecycle maintenance for your applications. We don't care about infrastructure. It truly is invisible now. So now our mindset needs to be DevOps delivers value. Those value are the applications the developers make. The infra infrastructure is invisible. Let's not talk about what size infrastructure for the application. Let's talk about what application business needs are there. ROI, TCO, compliance, keep it in Europe. Uh, make sure that only the QA team can deploy it and keep the Amazon bill under $30,000. Uh, keep the Azure bill under 30,000 Libra, whatever it is. So um, the whole point is that when we have a DevOps approach, we can integrate all the teams, the platforms, and the tools for your applications. We do this in an agnostic way, and you get workload performance out of it, and you can deploy it wherever you need it to. And this means, ultimately, not only do we give you automated deployment of your applications, but the governance around it, the auditability, the no notifications, the quotas, and so on, um, the operations for, to maintain it, what it takes to scale it up, scale it down, and back it up, and so on. And we can make all of this happen continuously, delegate it out to anybody else, and automate it through all your other systems, your monitoring systems, your build systems, so that your operations are delegated out. Okay. So just to summarize how we're going to deliver this enterprise cloud vision, um, Calm, I'll show you the product right now that we ship. Uh, we don't sell it anymore, but if you are really interested, we can do POCs with old Calm. But new Calm is coming into Nutanix Prism Central. That's the multi-cluster management interface. It makes sense. We'll be able to drive workloads across anything. Uh, we're doing that at the next dot next in June. That's be a coming out party, but early release will be probably around March. And this whole point, again, is to give you a single pane of glass experience for your applications now, not just for storage, not just for compute, but for your applications, making infrastructure invisible, giving you universal governance because now we tie together the teams, the budgets, the clouds, and the infrastructure all together. Single pane of glass, full auditability, full automatability, giving you life cycle management so it's one-click deploys and you can delegate that back out to your systems for continuous integration and for monitoring remediation and dynamic capacity. And every run book that you have on the wiki that we were talking about, yet another thing that VRO and VRA do very well, well, we need to make it work in every cloud for every form factor 
and not through any other indiscriminate in, in way to do it. So we need native operations, and we need to put op, uh, analytics on top of it. So full life cycle management, and this means that now the business and you work together to manage our workloads for business reasons, for business strategy. OK, let's get to the demo. Any questions so far? No questions? I'm sure you're curious. Let's make sure this happens, right? All right, here we go. All right, so first caveat, coming in the middle of next year, but if you want it today, talk to the local team. All right? Uh, we'll make it worth your while. Second thing, um, this is OldCom. As I sold it and supported it three months ago, this runs the Stock Exchange of India. That's where most of my colleagues are. I'm the only US employee. Uh, and this runs a whole number of other businesses, including containers and production for Druva. So this is the old interface. This will be updated to look like Prism Element, of course. The first thing we see here, uh, once we log into Nutanix Prism Central, we'll be authenticated, we'll be authorized, we'll know what team I'm on, we'll know what my roles are. And I'm in the admin in the system, so I have a big super view. I won't go into logging in and logging out to show you. It's a reduced set of capabilities. But the first thing we get to see is who's deploying what and how much. We can see you know, this, this example. And this is actually com.corp. I'm on the VPN right now. You can see all of Nutanix trying to learn about com right here. And you can also see who's winning, who's doing the most things. Well, it happens to be this QA team. Well, this happens to be Mark doing the QA team demos. All right, so now you can see how many demos I've done. How much value is Mark delivering? More than the rest of Nutanix combined. <laughs> That's just because they haven't caught up with me yet. Um, likewise, for each team, we can see their budgets. We can see exactly how much consumption they are, uh, their application deployments are, taking for whatever infrastructure it is. And again, I don't care if it's bare metal in the data center. I don't care if it's public or private cloud. Thank you. And I don't care if it's a container. And I don't care if it's in different places at the same time. We measure it all together for one holistic deployment, and this starts to consume our budget. So we can see Sudish, who's the president of the company, he's done one or two demos, right? That's pretty awesome. But Mark's still done 87% you know, of it you know, for the operations budget here. Making consumption visible is half of the battle in understanding how to control our infrastructure, how to control our costs, and how to manage the application lifecycle, as well as the access to it. So making it visible is half the battle. We give an overview of the populations of the data centers we can drive things to. Uh, we have an idea of recent blueprints, which are the application models. We have an idea of recent uh, deployments. Um, behind the scenes, let me just show you one real quick thing. I'll keep this to one minute. Where can we deploy to? Com has a whole bunch of native drivers, so it's really simple to drive to Amazon, Azure. Uh, if we don't even have that provider yet, if you have a VAX, an AS400, uh, an AIX system, or Solaris, or uh, some other data center provisioning tool, or CMDBs, or ITIL, we can bring those into the system and drive them because COM is agnostic. We model the application and all your systems. We drive them together. The endpoints are where we drive the workloads. That's the bottom of our tree. We work in a top-down fashion. And this allows us to not be platform-bound, as VRO and VRA is. Um, so if, if we don't even know how to do DigitalOcean for a customer, a, di a customer can put DigitalOcean in. All we need to do is agentlessly SSH or PowerShell to a resource that has the SDK, has the, S the CLIs, has a RESTful API, we can invoke it and bring it into the blueprint for your application orchestration. Uh, likewise, drive VMware, data centers, and all that good stuff. If you have any questions, follow up with the local team because we're now down to eight minutes. Um, likewise, we can leverage configuration management systems. Everybody does it differently, so we help you model it the way you want to do it today and refactor to the way you want to do it tomorrow. We leverage build systems so we can pull the latest artifacts and do application integration testing on a full integrated stack so you can be sure that latest build works, not just by itself, but with the whole uh, application. And likewise, we can pull from public and private repositories. So now we have all the building blocks that we will use to build our applications. This makes sense. This is a one-time operation that IT or operations or the data center or the DevOps people set up. Now let's build a blueprint. Uh, actually, let me show you a blueprint. We can't, uh, we don't have enough time to run it all. 
Really simple, three-tier application architecture. Load balancer in the front, web tier in the middle, that scales up and down, and databases on the back. You can see that I'm actually doing this as VMs in Amazon and containers as well. But let's make this small. Oh, I apologize for making it a little bit too small. But um, we can start to lock down who can access this authorization rules. Let's just say the QA team. You remember, you now know if I was going to do that. Um, the QA team is the only one that can deploy this application. And this application can only be deployed, say, in Amazon and AHV, but let's actually say, and also on our Metro cluster. Fine, great. Now, let's say that I need to get policies, uh, I need to get approval from the admin team to deploy this application. QA spins up too many, or for whatever reason. But, you know, Mark always forgets to spin down his demos. Let's put an expiration policy on top of this. It comes down in two hours. Let's make sure that the QA team, they might need to keep this demo around for forensics or bug reproduction. Let's get them to approve that deletion, even though we automatically schedule it. And let's let the, thank you, the operations team know that, yeah, everybody's cleaned things up. So we can do governance on the application lifecycle. We can also bring it down to operations on top of the individual VMs. Let's get an approval for a VM restart. That's disruptive to the application. Operations needs to approve it. The white lines between all these building blocks, and now we can provision them just about anywhere I want. In fact, let me show you how I can cut and paste. And this is a beautiful GUI. Let's rehost this, not on Amazon, but on VMware. Right now, all we need to do is pull from the center. Let's say what our route is, what's our host, all of this is coming in look directly. So this is all it takes. All we need to do is localize the base layer to spin up the resource, and then we can provision all of the end results. So now I can do a bake-off between Amazon off-premises and VMware on-premises and see where I get better performance. And not only that, I can drive different cost metals. You know, for VMware, I want to say it's, you know, half a euro an hour to run this application. But with Amazon, we automatically pull down the costs from Amazon and Azure. So a T1 micro in US West 2 turns out to be, I think, it's uh, two cents an hour. But let's override that. Let's make it you know, twice as expensive as VMware, because I want to incentivize the QA team to work on-prem when they need to, off-prem only to burst for big things. And so this is how simple it should be to refactor your deployment endpoints. This is the cross-cloud delivered. Um, next thing, orchestration. We'll get to all of that later on. I, I'd be happy to give you a deeper dive demo. So let's just make sure that this isn't all smoke and mirrors. Let's actually just run this deployment now because we're down to less than five minutes. Com has already figured out the order of operations and the blocking dependencies. Uh, the T, yep, five, good. Let's give this, uh, I'm on the QA team. I have the ability to go to the QA team. Let's put this deployment against that project budget and let's run it. So we're off to the races. This is the histogram of all the operations. So we'll be able to look back at you know what happened on the weekend if something fell over. We'll get this histogram. But this is day zero of this application, so we have nothing here. But this is how we slice and dice through the audit life cycle of all the operations of this application's life cycle. We will populate the TCO as these instances come up. And let's take a look at the policies. If you recall, we have an approval from the admin team. And we have an expiration of two hours. So anticipating that approval, let's bring that up. Approval pending. Let's be nice to Mark and deploy the VMUG IT. Thumbs up. All right. Now we're in progress. Uh, these services will start to populate, and we will start to populate the TCO. Again, we'll be able to tell you whether it's cheaper to run it with high IOPS and AHV or VMware versus public cloud, Amazon or Azure or anybody else. And you can put the cost models that you want us to model as well. This gives you the business power you've always wanted and needed and dreamt about. So let's take a look at the logical deployment. We're going to have two VMs uh, in Amazon. We're going to have a load balancer. We're going to have a Redis database. And already, you're starting to see all of the instrumentation, all the parameters that came from the COM blueprint, the COM runtime, from Amazon, from the Docker engine, and from the container itself. 
All of this information is now instrumentable for the rest of the application because we help orchestrate the entire ac application. We also have all of the forensics are coming in real time right now. You don't need to SSH onto any box. You can delegate this back to the team. The QA team now can see operations in flight. And we can see that this Docker run, we can even download the logs, the standard output of each operation. We see the timestamp, where it ran, who asked for it, and we'll even get the timestamp. So we'll be able to do analytics later on for operations and put auditability on top of it or even uh, governance on top of operations. This operation took 25, fifth, took 500% of the time expected. Should I automatically retry it? Should I get uh, approval from the operations team and so on? We're trying to make operations heuristic and testable as well. All right, so yeah, we have a Redis container and that took uh, 56 seconds to run. All right, let's see how the entire application is now going forward. You see all of the operations in flight right now across the entire application structure. It looks like the container backends are ready which unblocks the web tier to progress. But the web tier, well, it's taking some time. So now I can slice a dice across the logical, excuse me, the, uh, the application tiers as we've described it from the architecture. Slice and dice across all these things. While we're waiting for Amazon to catch up with us, let's go see what happens here. Um, I didn't show you this, but after we have the application deployment as a base layer, we literally layer operations on top of it and now this is how we delegate those operations out to anybody on the team or through our COM RESTful interface or through our CLI tooling, delegate it back to anybody else or any of other systems. So as soon as we finish this deployment, we will be able to enable upgrading apps, scaling up, scaling it down. And we have orchestration across the entire application state. We understand that we need to pull one node out to canary 1% of the web tier, bring it out of the load balancer, bring up uh, for an update operation, we could say, bring it out of the load balancer, silence Nagios, um, bring down, make sure the database connections are drained so we have no transactions in flight, and so on. So we have this ability to do as complex an orchestration as you used to do for your change controls and instrument it all and automate it all and delegate it all and audit it all and automate it all. So time, we're done, I'm sorry. Please follow up with the local sales team here uh, they're incredible people, and I'm ju not just saying that. It's a genuine pleasure to work with them. It's a genuine pleasure to be here. I hope I've given you a preview of VMware next year, and I hope you come and get it today. <laughs>